Live from the United Center, this is Channel 2 News. Special coverage of the Democratic National Convention, Chicago 96. From the heartland of the country, from the heart of the floor of this convention center, jubilant, a wash in color in what looks to be moonbeams coming down from the ceiling, 150,000 balloons, banners, American flags, a spectacular grand finale of the Democratic Convention. It wraps up tonight with a dramatic show of unity and a heartfelt thanks to the city of Chicago. I love Chicago for many reasons. For your powerful spirit, your sports teams, your lively politics, but most of all, for the love and light of my life, Chicago's daughter, Hillary. Good evening, live from the United Center, when the, where the partying continues at this moment. I'm Linda McLennan. And I'm Lester Holt of the Music of Les Miserables. The celebration continues with the President, First Lady, the Gores, surrounded by political friends still celebrating at this hour. Channel 2's Bill Curtis has been with the Illinois delegation throughout the night. Let's go to him now live for reaction to Mr. Clinton's speech. Bill? Holy cow! What an experience! This is a night to be proud of Chicago. It is raining mylar, confetti, balloons, and the Illinois delegation, half of them are up there. Senator Braun, Senator Simon, and the rest are down here. Let's uh, try to do a little business because over an hour, about an hour and ten minutes, he covered all the bases. David Wilhelm, what's new in that speech? Oh, I, I, I think this man wants to be president again because he spelled, a real, spelled out a real agenda for the next term. He focused on the absolute criticality of education in this country from, from reading to college education. I mean, I, I think that the choice this year is so clear between a Bob Dole campaign that stresses a reckless but what's new? What's education. new? Oh, what's new? Jim Wall, we, what, we were conferring here trying to think of all the things that we hadn't heard before. Well, we've got... Well, <laughs> you're overcome. Yeah, we're overcome. You know, I think it, this is a State of the Union address in many ways. He summarized, he summarized where he's been, but then he pushed forward into the future in the 21st century. Well, the bridge to the future, that was the That uh, was the main word. theme that he was pushing, bridge to the future. Notice how he touched on, he didn't give the partisan crowd any red meat to chew on. Yep, yep. It was a very statesmanlike, nothing partisan. Danny Devers, how'd you like it? I think it's incredible. As a matter of fact, it's difficult to describe. Um, I think it just blows the lid off of everything. This is the most fantastic we've ever seen. It's quieting down because this convention is coming to a close. Emil Jones, can I interrupt your prayer for just a moment? What was your reaction to the speech? Tremendous speech. I like the idea about we coming together to build that bridge to the 21st century and not build a bridge going backwards. We're on that super, on that information super highway where he wants all to go. I think the country will be behind him because he's a great president. Thank you. Gary LaPale, how'd you like it? I think it uh, put the whole election in perspective. We either want to move backward, as Bob Dole and uh, Jack Kemp want to do, or we want to move forward in the 21st century, educate our children better, and take care of our families better. Here's uh, Dick Durbin. I noticed you were smiling there when he uh, talked about a new Congress. Absolutely, and I tell you, the president's agenda to help working families really hits a nail on the head. Help them buy a home, help them pay for a college education for their kids, the kind of security people want to have, and it's going to take a new Congress to make that happen. Thank you, gentlemen. It has been a tiring four days, but the convention is just coming to a close with happy faces and happy smiles. Lester and Linda, back to you. All right, thank you, Bill. The president's speech hit many themes tonight, some of them you've just heard of. We asked Channel 2's political editor, Mike Flannery, to listen and then break down those themes for us. He's live with the key points. Mike? Well, Linda, you can't ignore, I think, the over the overriding impact of this thing. This president is a skillful speech maker in ways that his Republican challenger Bob Dole is not. With Bill Clinton you see him biting his lip uh, with a catch in his voice, with a lump in his throat, projecting emotion and empathy, all of it with an eye to making a political impact. And among the things he did tonight was to make a pledge that comes easily to a front runner on campaign tactics. It is legitimate, even necessary, to compare our record with theirs, our proposals for the future with theirs. And I expect them to make 
a vigorous effort to do the same. But I will not attack. I will not attack them personally or permit others to do it in this party if I can prevent it. Easy enough, of course, for a guy who has a 15 percentage point lead. He doesn't have to attack. It is the other side that must. Now, the president also proposed a series of things to give a boost to education. Every eight-year-old will be able to read. Every 12-year-old will be able to log in on the Internet. Every 18-year-old will be able to go to college. And all Americans will have the knowledge they need to cross that bridge to the 21st century. Now, attempting to blunt the bold Bob Dole 15 percent across the board tax cuts that are being offered by the Republicans in this campaign, well, Bill Clinton offered his own set of tax breaks. We should cut taxes for the family sending a child to college, for the worker returning to college, for the family saving to buy a home or for long-term health care, and a $500 per child credit for middle-income families raising their children who need help with child care and what the children will do after school. That is the right way to cut taxes. Pro-family, pro-education, pro-economic growth. And indeed, uh, you saw also that the president was pitching there hard for a Democratic Congress uh, with that 15 percentage point lead in the latest CBS News poll. He's obviously feeling confident enough to start focusing on some races. And indeed, there is a question that was asked in that CBS News poll, uh, Lester, and uh, it is an ominous one for the Republicans who now control Congress. It indicates that by a margin of 45 percent to 36 percent, voters across the country say they plan to vote for a Democrat for Congress. That would give control to the Democrats if that holds up and make uh, Richard Gephardt of Missouri the next Speaker of the House, knocking out Newt Gingrich. Reporting live from just outside the United Center, Mike Flannery, Channel 2 News. Back to you. All right, Mike. Well, we can tell you that the 1996 Democratic National Convention is now officially history. The gavel has fallen. It is over. But here's a man who's going to bask in it for just a little while longer, President Clinton, uh, surrounded by family, by political cronies, a, a crowded platform still basking in the limelight at this moment. No, uh, I don't think... I don't think one person has left that podium, and as you say, it is jam-packed up there. Normally, I, we have uh, all this week been joined by the Reverend Jesse Jackson to offer a little insight. We can tell you, you see him right there in the back. I don't think he'll be joining us today. No one's going to get out of this pack uh, for some time. The First Lady watched most of the speech from in the stands not far from us. About three-quarters of the way through the speech, the First Lady and uh, the First Daughter were escorted uh, down to the tunnel and out to the other side where they joined uh, President Clinton uh, at the end of the speech. Carol Mosley Braun, Senator from Illinois, uh, with the President right now at the front there. Saw some of the cabinet me uh, members up there as well. Chelsea Clinton, a few seconds ago, still acknowledging the crowd and waving. Uh, but nobody seems to want this party to end. And it, it, it's no suspense. We certainly knew how it was going to end, although I've got to tell you, this is my fifth political convention. I've never seen quite a balloon and confetti drop like this one. It just kept coming and coming and coming. First came down what you see, the little, they look like moonbeams, really. It was silver mylar confetti, fairly large. Then the balloons started coming down, blue, red, then white. And then the blue, red, and white confetti, tinsel, more mylar confetti. Tinsel still floating to the air here. Uh, we have all marveled this week. Uh, it is hard not to be a Chicago booster this week. If you were from this city, uh, we're all very proud of what has occurred here in terms of the show the city was able to put on. But what happened in the United Center was something uh, hard to describe. Those of you who've been here for uh, sporting events would not recognize what they have done here. Interestingly, they have to dismantle what it took them 40 some odd days to put up in here. I think they have 10 days to dismantle all of this because of a Neil Diamond concert that's coming into this hall. But as you say, it resembles in no way whatsoever uh, uh, the giant, wonderful new sporting hall that it normally is. Well, I think uh, it's certainly a successful convention. Uh, time will tell whether it was a successful co convention politically for President Clinton, but certainly a successful uh, convention for the city of Chicago. This is the outside shot uh, of police controlling a pretty wide area uh, around the United Center. These are uh, apparently guests who are leaving now. The delegates don't look like they've left the floor. It is still crowded down below, but there were thousands of guests uh, who've had the lucky tickets to be uh, in the stands tonight. Uh, this was uh, from, uh, this is still a live picture now, looking at the podium. He's 
still talking despite the fact that his voice is already pretty hoarse. Well, he spoke for, boy, I lost the time on it, but uh, I think it was about an hour and 10, roughly an hour and 15 minutes, uh, obviously interrupted by numerous times by applause. They had timed that speech out to 45 minutes, and then they had to factor in, of course, the applause, and that took it uh, well beyond that, that period. This place was packed to the rafters. There's the president's brother. Uh, and his wife and their little son, the president, referred to them during his speech. This place was packed to the rafters. And I can tell you that in the seats up along the sides, it looks like almost everybody has cleared out, or a lot of people have cleared out. But as you said, the floor is still jam-packed, as is the podium. Well, this is a shining and a special moment for the president, but probably hasn't been the best couple of days for other reasons, and that is because of uh, scandal rocking his campaign. And tonight, there are friends and foes of the president who are questioning the timing of a splashy tabloid article that has taken down Mr. Clinton's top political advisor. It's a front page story that puts Dick Morris in the middle of a sex scandal, forcing his abrupt resignation from the Clinton campaign. Morris is credited with being the man who crafted Mr. Clinton's centrist image. Tonight he's being painted as a person who told the president's secrets to a prostitute. Channel 2's Jay Levine has the latest in the story. Jay? Lester, the dramatic and emotional ending of this convention, which you can still see going on behind me, makes it hard to remember the storm clouds which gathered over this United Center earlier today. Storm clouds brought on by the same supermarket tabloid which paid Jennifer Flowers for her story four years ago about her affair with the president when he was governor, her alleged affair with the president when he was governor of Arkansas. Well, now that same tabloid has the president's top political strategist under fire, a man who in a few short days has gone from kingmaker to outcast. This week's time called him the man who has Clinton's ear. Now he's Bill's bad boy, the president's million dollar image maker who allegedly spent his idle hours with a high priced hooker, Sherry Rollins, taking calls from the president while the two were in bed. He motioned her to come over and sit on the couch next to him and uh, get real close and he held the receiver up, up to her, you know, between them so she could hear. And she said, no doubt about it, this is the president's voice. Supermarket tabloid reporter Richard Gooding has seen her notes, listened to her tapes, and allegedly photographed the two of them last week wearing only bathrobes on a hotel balcony. A statement from Morris called it yellow journalism, which I will not dignify with a response, ever. The White House responded quickly after learning of the story late yesterday. Was he asked for his resignation? The answer is no. Uh, he voluntarily uh, submitted it to the campaign. The campaign accepted it overnight. The president was informed of it this morning. The president called Morris my friend and said he would always be grateful for his contributions. Dick Morris, who helped engineer the president's political comeback, left the Sheraton early this morning, heading home to Connecticut. Mayor Daley was quick to defend the president, downplaying the impact of the alleged scandal. I don't think there's going to be political damage. This is just something, someone's personal life. Others said the only reason the story was getting so much play was because of the lack of controversy this week. This had the effect of uh, uh, dropping a big piece of meat in a shark tank uh, with sharks who hadn't been fed for a long time. The convention's first controversy didn't stop the crowd from giving the president a hero's welcome. And one of the president's top aides, Chicagoan Rahm Emanuel, speaking from the skybox where he'd watched tonight's speech, didn't feel it would distract from his message either. Doesn't this come at the worst possible time? The most, what's the best possible time is that for him to stand at that podium and lay out his vision for the future of the American people. Is this a distraction? The most important thing for the people is to hear from their president what he wants to do in the next four years to build a better America. 